You're listening to Drug Positive, the risk reduction and benefit enhancement podcast, reducing shame and stigma to save lives and end the drug war. Hey, everyone. I hope everyone had fun on Halloween. We did. Yeah, we actually went trick or treating. We love Halloween. Yeah, we it's do. It's such a great holiday. I love the creativity, the costumes. It was always my favorite uh, holiday as a kid. And uh, we actually dressed up and went trick or treating this year. Mm hmm. I wore my dragon mask that I started working on last year. And I think that uh, I'm going to settle into a tradition of just wearing the same mask every year and working on it <laughs> over time. <laughs> So Nevada City is great on Halloween. People get really into it. Hundreds of people come out in the streets in costumes. Thousands. Are you kidding? From all over the county. We've got a haunted house, an actual haunted hotel. The National Hotel has been featured on like haunted place TV shows and Mm -hmm. everything. It's Old West style. It's really the perfect Yeah, Yeah, the whole town is like an Old West uh, historical landmark. We're also a center of psychedelic culture here. You know, Mm -hmm. MAPS' Zendo project is based here. Dance Safe makes the uh, testing kits and ships them out here. There's a lot of psychedelic therapists. So, you Mm -hmm. know, that's why it was really disappointing that... All we got was candy. I I mean, come on. Kept hearing that people were handing out ecstasy tablets. Ecstasy tablets, LSD-laced gummy bears all over the news. We went house to house trick-or-treating, and when we got home... Nothing, just, just candy. candy. Come on, you guys. <laughs> Unbelievable. Remember that one house? They were kind of trippy. I thought for sure we were going to get some ecstasy tablets. And you know. <laughs> Actually, it's... <laughs> Guess what, everyone? It's really just a it's myth. It's bullshit. It has never happened, despite what's being said in the media. It's just a... Nobody gives your children drugs on Halloween. Yeah. Who would do that? They're too expensive. Traditional scare tactic. So, surprise, you actually just heard our intro to Drug Nonsense. That's right. If you want to hear us go off more about the myth that your children are getting drugs in their Halloween candy, head over to patreon.com and for $3 a month, you can have access to Drug Nonsense. Okay, now let's get on to our real show, this episode of Drug Positive. All right. Hi, everyone. So this isn't really a Halloween show. It's a Halloween show. We went to Halloween. That's right. We just got back from Halloween. What an amazing festival. I really, this festival is beloved by people everywhere. We met a European festival participant. What is that, 25,000 people? It sounds right. I don't know. <laughs> it's in uh, Live Oak, Florida, North Florida. Amazing music. Uh, we heard it was started by String Cheese Incident. That uh, makes sense because they played seven times at the festival. Mm-hmm. We also saw Jamiroquai. All kinds of yeah. incredible live acts. STS-9. Tipper. Saw Tipper for the first time. Mm-hmm. We discovered some new musicians who real love. Marco Beneventi was a mm-hmm. new discovery for us. that We just happened upon his set and mm-hmm. danced like crazy. Right. A lot of uh, guitar, full band based stages out there too, along with electronic music and really psychedelic. The light shows and the art, Spirit Lake. Such a magical Amazing. venue. I mean, so many little places to go. The lake and the art right around the lake was just an enchanted world. I I, I started crying when we first went in there because it was so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So it was a wonderful experience. And we, we, we took uh, LSD, mushrooms, and MDMA. I think those were the... And ketamine. And ketamine, that's right. And so, cannabis. <laughs> and cannabis, a little bit of that too. <laughs> So, wow, five five psychedelics that we took to enhance our experience there. It was uh, it was super fun, you know. And one of the reasons that we went and what this episode is really all about is the fact that Dance Safe was staffing there. Mm-hmm. Dance Safe Florida and Dance Safe Georgia were there. And so mm-hmm. we volunteered. This is your first time volunteering with Dance Safe, I think, huh? It was, yeah. yeah. How was it staffing the booth? 
I am just so impressed by <laughs> these people. They're so sweet and kind. Uh, my first day staffing there, I discovered that both of the folks I was working with are also artists, and we spent a lot of the time chatting about oil painting. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, it was just, I mean, I've made so many new friends. I'm just so yeah. happy to meet these people. And we did some pill testing, some drug mm-hmm. checking. Was it the first time you witnessed that live? Uh, well, uh, I've just seen a couple of tests in our kitchen, but other than that, yeah, yeah I've never been out at an event doing that for the public. Uh-huh. And, and my we goodness. got some live audio of that, which you're going to hear. That's right. I'm really Mm -hmm. excited about the fact that it actually worked. You don't always know when you go out into the field with a mic, how much are you going to get? How much is good? How much can you use? And this was great audio, amazing conversations, beautiful statements from the volunteers. I'm really excited Mm -hmm. to share the voices of the volunteers. Yeah, this is a different kind of episode, everyone. We don't have one main interview. I guess the topic is Dance Safe in the Field. With this episode, we're hoping to give you a feel of what it's like to be involved with Dance Safe, and maybe hopefully some of you will become volunteers after hearing this. Yeah, I hope so. I hope this really inspires folks to get involved, to contribute, because after hearing these interviews today, I think you're going to understand how much Dance Safe helps everyone. It helps everyone who is at the festival. It's a beautiful experience for those who are involved. Mm-hmm. Now, you didn't get to interview all the volunteers. But why don't you give a shout out to everyone who is there? All right. So these are uh, some of the volunteers. Thank you so much to these amazing human beings who came to help their peers at this festival. Christine, Joey, Stacy, Lauren, Jamie, Alex, Calvin, Taylor, Laura, John, Dirty, and Kyle. <laughs> I, I don't know. I hope we didn't miss anyone, but um, we love all all of you That's guys. right. That's right. Thank you, everyone. We had a great time. Can't wait to go back to another Florida or Georgia Dance Safe event. You know, Florida is my home state. I was born in St. Petersburg. I started Dance Safe in California, in the Bay Area. So it's just wonderful for me that there is now a Florida chapter and I can go back to my home state and yeah. participate in Dance Safe. Simply reminding myself that I was in Florida and I was in the South just made the whole event just spectacular. It's it's incredible. It's a mind-blowing experience to be in the South within that event and in touch with this actually very diverse crowd of people, but all of them open-minded and loving and drug positive. I mean, it was a pretty drug positive event that DanceSafe was able to test. We even tested for the police there, everyone. The police were all worried that they got exposed to fentanyl because there's a bit of fentanyl hysteria going on. And they came to us to get some fentanyl test strips. We we, we tested a a sticker Mm -hmm. for them. Yeah, so this is one of those situations where there's sort of a placebo effect where the panic of fear around fentanyl causes someone to actually think that they've been affected physically. So here's what happened. A festival attendee, a young woman, is handing out stickers and she hands a sticker to a staff person with the festival medical team, another young woman. And for whatever reason, this young woman felt that she might have been poisoned by fentanyl from touching this sticker that the back of the sticker wasn't even peeled off and she went into a panic uh, and she was actually hospitalized Mm -hmm. and when after she was taken to the emergency room the rest of the medical staff gave the sticker to the sheriff's department who was at the event and they were in a panic that someone was there handing out fentanyl laced uh, stickers so they tracked us down and even before we did the test, I told them, you you know, really can't absorb fentanyl through your skin. This is true. It's a myth out there. The reason I think stickers uh, have become a source of panic is because pharmaceutical fentanyl is delivered in the form of patches which go on your skin. But they had to spend millions of dollars developing technology to put other chemicals in with the fentanyl in the patch in order to get it to be able to go through your skin. It won't happen. So I kind of knew right from the beginning that this was just a panic. And I told the officer that. But we tested, of course, for her anyway. And um, of course, it was negative. Yeah, I think this is a topic that we may spend more time on in the future um, because there's so much fear around fentanyl and there's a lot of misinformation and panic going on. 
It's true. And it's a bit understandable given how many people these days are dying from fentanyl lace drugs. Mm -hmm. So it's really powerful seeing psychedelic culture really taking off and, and growing. The drug positivity of the event was really beautiful. And the art was mind blowing. Uh, one time we were sitting by the lake and there was a screen of mist being shot up by fountains at night. And there were images projected on the mist. This was so cool, everyone. <laughs> I don't know who first uh, came up with this concept, but they were shooting up water that created a wall of water that they then projected 3D digital imagery on. So we were all sitting on the side of this lake with cypress trees covering it. And then there were these mystical three-dimensional figures and images dancing over top of the lake mm -hmm. uh, because the water, the spray, was serving as the medium in which it appeared. Yeah, and uh, there were mazes with beautiful paintings and sculptures you could climb through and structures of all kinds. It was just fantastic. Yeah. It was so beautiful. And I actually I uh, made my costume, my little space creature hat. The picture, there's a picture of it in the Facebook discussion group. I pulled it off. I made yeah. a little guy floating above the earth. <laughs> yeah, space creatures was the theme. Yeah. Uh, do subscribe to our Facebook discussion group if you're a listener. It's a private group only for listeners, different from the Facebook page. This is mm -hmm. a group you get more more intimate with our listeners there. Mm -hmm. So uh, another treat that's coming up a little later in this episode is another segment of People on Drugs. Oh, and that's right. uh, our friend Kyle takes ketamine for the first time. That's right. You'll get to hear that. Yeah. Oh, okay, so let's hear from the volunteers. Here we go with the episode. Christine Bauer, I'm the Deputy Director of Dance Safe Florida. My name is Joey Venero, and I am a volunteer with Dance Safe Florida. My name is Erin, and I am Deputy Director of Georgia Chapter for Dance Safe. My name is Erica Dara, I'm the Chapter Head for Georgia Dance Safe. The first thing I did was 20 years ago when he came out with the cards. When Emmanuel showed up at my house explaining what it was, handed me the deck of cards, and it was on. So we started our drug education and we gave all of the educational materials to our son when he was eight. We started parenting our son with a harm reduction philosophy. Subsequently, he was straight edge until he was 21. I have an empty nest now, but I still have the urge to mother. I believe in it more than ever now. I believe in decriminalization. I believe prohibition is a nightmare. I feel like at 50 years old, I can safely stick my neck out and make myself a target. I'm kind of fearless about it. I first heard about Dance Safe several years ago from my older brother when I started getting into the EDM scene and he wanted to keep me safe. He told me about Dance Safe and testing my substances and being educated. I came across Dance Safe after I got involved with SSDP, Students for Sensible Drug Policy, and I fell in love right away. As somebody who deeply wants to work with and research psychedelics for my future career, I see the pathways that we need to form in order for this to be integrated into our society in a correct way where we can educate people on not only the substances themselves, but how to handle difficult experiences, how to take care of yourself. It's so important. I first heard of Dance Safe through SSDP, then I saw Dance Safe at Imagine 2015 and was like, oh my god. So I'm graduating with my bachelor's degree this year and I'm figuring out how I can focus my research on psychedelic psychotherapy. I want to see I begin go through clinical trials, whatever I have to do to do that. I wanted to keep going to festivals, but like I have really bad social anxiety and so like having a role to play as somebody to help educate and be present for people, like I can do that. Wow, that was awesome. Totally love these people. These young people are our future. They see the path going forward to bring psychedelics into the mainstream, basically. They're working in their educational institutions to not just to study psychedelics, but to create a way to study psychedelics. I, I think some of these young people have to sort of create their own programs or, you know, there's so much interest in it that it's just carrying the knowledge and the science and the integration forward on this wave 
wave of enthusiasm from these folks. It's really great. And I'm so proud. I love these volunteers so much. I love the fact that Dance Safe is drug positive and that people understand the connection between the benefits of drugs and harm reduction or risk reduction. Yeah. It's really great that these are these this is how I began it. These are the people initially attracted to it. These are the people who created Dance Safe. And similar to you, many or most of these people have incredible uh, positive experiences with drugs that have helped them in their lives. Erin, who is one of the women I interviewed, has an incredible story that I would love to talk to her more about uh, uh, healing her brain with mushrooms. It's uh, Something that has changed her life, Mm -hmm. basically made her life possible. The healing is so, she's healed to such a great extent through the use of psychedelics that it's almost like she's amplified her whole potential in her whole life. Same here. That's why I started Dance Safe. These substances really, really helped me as well. Mm -hmm. That's really uh, funny that Christine mentioned me. I, I actually remember when I went to her house and brought the uh, the drug info cards to her when her son Nicholas was only eight years old. And yeah, she, she showed him those cards right away. I was thinking, oh, eight is a little bit young. But uh, what's really um, interesting is, you know, not only did Nicholas wait until he was 21, but then he became a full-on psychonaut. Mm-hmm. And uh, he and I, at some point later when I visited, he and I actually did uh, one of the research chemicals together one afternoon. Uh, I can't remember what it was, 4FA, something like that. It was kind of a, a stimulant drug, and we had a good time together. So Nicholas has uh, become a very responsible uh, person, a uh, very responsible drug user, and it's a testament to harm reduction parenting. And who knew 20 years ago when you brought those cards to Christine that we'd meet up with her at a psychedelic festival volunteering for Dance Safe? Yeah, it's really surprising to me that uh, it took her this long to get involved in Dance Safe. But she's kick ass, and I'm really uh, glad that she's now the Dance Safe Festi Mama. Also, I want to mention Ibogaine because that came up in Erica's interview, and people might not know what that is. Ibogaine is a psychedelic that. I heard, first heard about back in the 90s as something that could interrupt addictions and cure That's people right. from addictions. And way back in the 90s, it wasn't even tested uh, scientifically yet, but it was known. That's right. It's a derivative of the iboga plant. It's a long-acting, very intense psychedelic. I've never taken it, but uh, I've heard stories. I've talked to a lot of people who have. It lasts up to 48 hours, and it gives people a really deep experience to confront their issues and why they might be misusing drugs, using drugs to escape. And it also has this peculiar and very important quality that it takes away opiate cravings for those 48 hours, which is very important to help people who are trying to recover. It's a powerful medicine. And uh, Erica said her goal, she's very focused and very determined to get Abigail in clinical trials. That's great. Very important. Right now, you have to go to other countries in order to get the uh, therapy, and it can be prohibitively expensive to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's SSDP that was brought up in the interviews? SSDP is Students for Sensible Drug Policy. They're kind of like our sister organization. I've always seen them that way because they started almost the same year we did uh, in 1998. And Dance Save actually did start in 1998, but we didn't come up with the name until the spring of 1999. So we kind of grew up together and both organizations are are still around and uh, we love SSDP. You should check them out. Yeah. So at the festival, uh, Dance Safe has a booth where people can approach and get all kinds of information, earplugs, water, condoms, candy, all kinds of stuff. And then back in the uh, camping area was a testing booth. That's right. We uh, were allowed to test there, but we weren't allowed to test publicly. So when people approached the booth with something to test, we had to walk them over to the camping area where we had a tent uh, and we did the testing inside of the tent. And it's really interesting to me how far reagent testing has come. Originally, we only had one testing kit, marquee reagent, and all it could do was tell you if you had an MD compound. MDMA or MDA, that's pretty much all we can do. Now we have eight reagents that can really give us a lot of information about what's in the pill or powder. 
Yeah, it's fascinating. It's a very involved process. And yeah, you're about to hear some of it. You're, you're also going to see at the same time some of the limitations in reagent testing. So here we have an audio recording of a couple that approached the booth because they wanted to test some suspected MDMA and cocaine. All right, let's go to that testing booth. Here we go. Um, so we got two people here want to test some drugs. What do you have? What do you hope you have? Uh, beans and some coke. All right, so we got, we got an ecstasy tablet and some cocaine. Now this is a, is this a letter B? What is that? Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. It looks like a letter B. It's kind of gray. And we'll use marquee reagent first, and this should go quickly to black if it's an MD compound, MDA or MDMA. And it does. And it looked like most of that powder reacted, so that's um, a good sign that if there is something else in it, there's not much. Of course, reagents can never detect purity, but it looked like all that powder reacted, so that's a good sign too. Now, Simon's reagent, it tests for the secondary amine, and it's a two-stage test, so after we put this second drop on, if it turns blue, that is, indicates the presence of the secondary amine, which makes it MDMA. So you put two drops and you just drop the second drop and it's turning blue. And it's turning blue. MDMA is in there. <laughs> All right. Yay. <laughs> it's in there. <laughs> okay. Do we know how much of it is MDMA? With press tablets, you can never tell how many milligrams are in it because it's got binder material mixed with it. Like you could weigh it, but it isn't not going to matter. Right. Um, again, just because I've tested so many pills, I can sort of tell by the strength of the reaction whether it's predominantly that, and it's a pretty strong reaction. Okay. And Thank so you. I would say it's, it's predominantly MDMA. We yeah. just have to give the disclaimer. We right. don't know if it's pure. Only, you got a lab test. Okay, so now testing cocaine is a bit different. There's a number of things to test for. The most important is fentanyl. Yeah. Uh, don't ask me why people are putting fentanyl and cocaine, but they are. Fentanyl-laced cocaine fatalities are on the rise. Yeah. So we use the fentanyl strips for that. Where's the strips? Okay. Two lines is negative. One line is positive. So you can see the water traveling up. Yeah, so there's two lines already appearing. So that's that's negative for fentanyl. Awesome. Yeah, yeah awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, so now the other thing we can do is test it for amphetamines and levamisole. Levamisole is a cut that's very common in cocaine because it doesn't cook away when people make crack. Mm -hmm. And so if you're buying coke to make crack, then it looks like you getting more pure coke but unfortunately it's a, a, a veterinary deworming agent and uh, taking too much of it uh, is, can cause immune system problems if you're a regular cocaine user you should probably always test for levamisole wow. uh -huh. okay. um, and so we use marquee and lieberman reagents so let's um, get a tiny bit out okay so you do not want this to turn orange That's uh, orange uh, enough that uh, indicates the presence of amphetamine. So let's do another bit with the Simons, and then we can tell whether that's amphetamine or methamphetamine. So it didn't turn blue, so there's no meth in it. So we don't have methamphetamine, but we have amphetamine? Amphetamine, and that's pretty common. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, man. It's very informative. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate okay. it. We really appreciate your help. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, well, uh, in enjoy the MDMA. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> Poor people. <laughs> Florida is just a wash in fake cocaine. Dan Safe staffers have told me in the South that almost all of it is just amphetamine mixed with lidocaine, no cocaine at all. And mm -hmm. that's probably why it tested negative for levamisol and, of course, negative for fentanyl, too, thank goodness. But um, I don't think there was really any cocaine. So let's hear some more interviews with the volunteers. All right, here we go. 
my favorite story, it actually happened just last month in uh, Asheville Valley, Missouri. One night while doing outreach, going around and basically looking for people in K-holes, I found a guy named Daniel and he was stuck in a K-hole in the middle of the field, 38, 40 degree weather, not having a good time. Poor Daniel, he just needed some help. So I found him, I damn near tripped over him. I sat down with him and I talked to him and he was like, I, I don't know what's going on. I took some ketamine and now I came with him. I was like, you're in a K-hole, it's fine. You're not dying. You just need to sit here until you come back to this world. Don't try to move around. Don't try to do stuff and, and, and until we can get you over to the booth. And then you can just lay down there and relax until you work these drugs out of your system. One night we were at a festival and we were off the clock and there were two people left at the booth. It was very late and we had all wandered off in different directions. We kind of all turned and looked over our shoulder at the dance safe booth at the same time and we saw that Jamie was struggling with an individual on the ground. Everyone who was off the clock just descended on the booth and there were five medical emergencies that night and nobody was off the clock after that. Our Orlando chapter is led by Kyle Adamson, and it was Kyle's first real test of his leadership position, and he completely aced it. it. Two people were taken away in ambulances, but the other medical emergencies were handled by the team right there, and they resolved themselves. So I've seen my team absolutely launch into action when there's a crisis, and they work so beautifully together. They're just like mind-reading machines. Everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing, and they do it. He was just so grateful to have me there, and just to have someone to talk to, and he kept apologizing, and I'm like, dude, I literally drove halfway across the country to take care of you. Like, this is my job. This is what I'm doing here. Sometimes all somebody needs to like make or break their night is hand sanitizer or like an antacid or somebody to sit with them while they collect themselves. Christine definitely knew how to handle the situation better than the EMTs did. The EMTs in Missouri are very receptive to drug education because they were so hard hit by the fentanyl epidemic. We had a group of EMTs gathered around the booth taking down notes from us. They're like, tell us, what do we do? What can we expect? How do we deal with ketamine and DMT? And we're like, it's not an emergency situation. It's, they need to be babysat. And a lot of EMTs don't understand that. They'll send you to the hospital. If you're on a deem strip and someone takes you to a hospital, that terrifying. I don't want to even move if I'm on DMT. I don't want to move. I personally don't know who I am or what happened if I'm on DMT. And the same thing with ketamine. Like, you don't want to move someone on ketamine because that's what makes people sick. If you just stay in the hole and go inside your head, then you're okay. We can be a point of contact for so many. We're like a point of contact between all types of ordeals. If we can just intervene at the right moment at the right time and we can save so many people's nights or keep them comforted or hold their stuff for them while they can't hold anything. All of those small interactions builds the community and the trust and like, well, I don't know anybody here, but I know that bright yellow sign, those people are nice to me and they'll help me. I remember this one guy, he was so lost and he came up to the booth asking where lost and found was and you could just tell in his face he was going through something and I walked with him and I just listened and I just sat with him. After he was able to reconnect with his friends and like find his group of people, it was just this look on his face of relief. I do a lot of trip sitting for Dan Safe, so I've had some really wonderful experiences trip sitting. Um, I've made some amazing friends here because they have wandered over to the Dan Safe booth while they were slightly impaired and just chilled with us all night and gave us an opportunity to get to know each other and now we're friends for life. And then we've also had, you know, medical emergencies that if we weren't on the ground, it would have been a whole different experience for those people who were already having a difficult experience with their trip.
people, the youth of America, are taking DMT en masse. <laughs> I did not realize this. This is a new thing. This has really <laughs> surprised us. We were uh, we were at Tipper's set. Uh, I think that was Saturday night, and we smelled a strange smell that we recognized. <laughs> That's right. DMT, if you've ever smelled it, is very distinctive and awful smelling. And so we thought, you know, this is ridiculous. Let's just move over and get away from this cloud of DMT smoke. Uh, never really smelled that in a concert before. Maybe it's those folks who are sitting down over there. I don't even know who, mm-hmm. who is even smoking DMT in this then place. We looked around. We <laughs> couldn't. See. It's a very crowded field, so, yeah, right? Yeah, very the- crowded. So we pushed our way through. You know, it's on this hillside with trees and hammocks. Push our way through and find a little... Uh, on the way, of course, another puff of DMT smoke comes into our nostrils. Uh-huh. So some kid who didn't uh, understand said, hey, is someone smoking a glow stick? Because that's yeah. what it smells like. <laughs> it smells like mothballs to me. Yeah. And so we pass through that cloud of smoke and get to a hammock and decide, okay, let's uh, camp out here. And there's a incredible visuals for this show. So we're trying to see the screen down below and then... Sure enough, another (laughs) puff of DMTs. What is going on? uh, uh, Ketamine, too. You know, we have that ketamine story that Joey told us about. People are taking ketamine and DMT. Extremely popular. Uh, Whereas, you know, I've always given the harm reduction advice that those two drugs you should always do at home or at least... uh, always sitting down Mm -hmm. it needs a very controlled situation (laughs) because you leave you go away like joey said uh when you're on dmt you don't even know where you are it's hard to imagine you have to really dose it carefully but you know i think the reason we're seeing this happen is because of vape pens that's right it's the technology yeah you don't have to light a lighter and you can make your vape juice with the amount of DMT that you want. And so I think these people are just taking very light doses, which maybe you can continue to stand up uh, and watch a show and look at these visuals. uh, And it's very short acting anyway. So if they do dose a little too much, they will be back soon. Right. (laughs) (laughs) I guess you just have to be really careful. It's fascinating to me, though, that that Really, this means that DMT is going to be entering the mainstream because people are walking around with these vape pens in their pockets and doing them in social situations. That's right. So more and more people, mainstream Americans, are going to be taking DMT. What does that mean? It's just beginning. Yeah. The technology to be able to smoke DMT in public without calling attention to yourself. Except for Uh, the smell. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) No way to avoid. Someone's going to figure out a way to deodorize DMT. Yeah, that's probably what's coming next. Um, But, you know, uh, when people talk about things like putting LSD in the water supply or whatever, it it puts me in mind of those sorts of thoughts when I think about DMT coming home to family Thanksgiving or something like that. Like people who don't have experience with these psychedelics can really have their mind blown by these experiences. DMT is something that takes you to an otherworldly place. You're like on another planet. You're interacting with creatures. Well, I think that there's really two types. Types of DMT. There's pre-breakthrough experiences on light doses, which I'm sure is what people were doing at the Tipper concert. And then there's post-breakthrough doses, which are the ones that I think are very therapeutic. DMT tends to teach you things about yourself, expand your consciousness in ways that stick with you and can make many people a better person. But I think uh, before you get to that point, it's just really colorful. Like the pre-breakthrough experiences are not quite as therapeutic, not quite as enlightening, just more colorful and fun. So I'm going to predict that we're going to start hearing about DMT in popular culture in the next few (laughs) years because of this why don't you send us your stories call in and let us know if you've had any interesting uh dmt stories both uh breakthrough or pre-breakthrough the number again to leave a message and we may air it on the show is 530 drug guy d-r-u-g-g-u-y should we do a harm reduction tip now you know why not? I think that should be what don't take large doses of ketamine while standing up at a concert. 
Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people like doing those small bumps of ketamine to feel a little bit floaty. Must be careful with that. The uh, ketamine is the only psychedelic drug that has an addiction potential, and there have been many people who have gotten themselves a little too hooked on ketamine, and long-term use of ketamine can cause permanent bladder damage. So you really shouldn't do too much ketamine. It should be something you use few and far between. And so, you know, the way I think you get the most out of ketamine is by doing large doses on your back uh, or in a chair and listening to music and going deep within your mind and learning something. Yeah, the setting is extremely important for these two, ketamine and DMT. Make sure that you're with people that you know and trust in a safe physical situation. That's another very, very important piece of harm reduction advice because you do become incapacitated. Mm -hmm. All right, now, speaking of ketamine, we have another segment of People on Drugs. This is a great one. Kyle does such a good job explaining his experience. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, this is very interesting, people. So Kyle's a dance safe volunteer, and he invited us to stay in his RV at Hula. So we were all uh, in his RV. It was uh, Tatiana and I and Kyle and his friend Zoe. And Kyle had never taken ketamine before and was very interested in here. So here we were all with friends in a safe place. And so here he is on 100 milligrams of ketamine and we actually got him to talk and describe his experiences while he was on it here we go ketamine people on drugs we are recording yeah (laughs) so this is very interesting this experience what's it like i gotta be honest with you like um it kind of separates yourself from yourself. Are you there right now? Yeah. You're on a 100 milligram dose? Mm-hmm. So where are you? I would say it's like um, like an ice lake. An ice lake? A lake of ice that's been frozen in time. And that I'm staring at it, though. That's what uh, that's what I feel like right now. This re- relates to that moment in my life when I took DXM because I was unable to move. Yeah. But I was able to still compile my thoughts together uh-huh. and communicate them to my body, <laughs> and, ab- and and which enabled me to move. Uh huh. I feel like because of my psychedelic experiences, I was able to move. And that's how I'm experiencing this crystal lake right now. I see. Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, you know, you want to try to figure out everything at once, but it does never work that way. It doesn't. You You can't do it. You have to just live life, you know? (laughs) <laughs> so that is such classic ketamine right there. That was really funny. I love how he uh, thinks that his previous psychedelic experience allowed him to get through this struggle in trying to move his body. Yeah, psychedelic superhero, psychedelic ninja. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of uh, Neo in The Matrix, you know, how he mm-hmm. had to develop his skills inserting those programs to learn martial arts etc and how to how to control the environment with his mind mm-hmm. you know that's really funny just and, control uh, his own body with his mind yeah <laughs> and so there, there's actually part two to this we're going to go hear a little more now from kyle still on ketamine describing more about this uh earlier dxm experience that he had are we ready i'm ready are you ready let's do it here we go so we're on our way to ultra music festival in miami Right? Uh-huh. Me and my brother. And we had already dosed out DXM. Like, we already knew what we were supposed to take. But for some reason, at this moment in time, we dosed and it affected us differently, which is what I was explaining earlier. Uh-huh. And, oh my God. It was like we arrived at Ultra Music Festival and I'm unable to walk. Because I'm so fucked up on DXM that I can't even, like, associate (laughs) my mind thoughts with my body parts. Like, I literally can't walk. Like, I I couldn't 
Yeah, you don't. You're not supposed to take dissociatives and walk. You're supposed to take right. dissociatives lying on your back. <laughs> so, so we're sitting in the parking lot, right? And my brother's like, "Kyle, are you gonna be okay?" Blake. Yeah, this is Blake. <laughs> my brother passed away in 2010. This is Blake. This is a Blake story. Uh, so, I'm like, just give me a couple minutes, man. You know. And so I'm trying to communicate my mind to my body. Like I'm trying to tell my 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 toe to move, my knee to move. I'm trying to like <laughs> actuate my thoughts into action, and I'm doing this in slow motion all this time. And that's what I was talking about earlier, where it's like if you're not advanced in the art of psychedelia, then anybody else wouldn't have been able to walk into ultra that day. But I did. <laughs> On the DXM, <laughs> which I was completely uh, fucked. Uh, I was I, that. This is the similar feeling to that. Uh, yeah. They, so they are a similar class of drugs. They're yeah. both dissociative anesthetics. When yeah. don't do DXM at home, kids, uh, or only oh, right. do it at home. Right? No, well, that's the thing. See, this is the weird part because DXM. The weird thing about it is that it was the same dose we had done before. But it uh-huh. affected me completely differently. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So that's why yeah. after this experience I had with DXM, I was like, let's never do that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it's a dirty dissociative. Right. Uh, so ketamine, this is the effect every time. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Ketamine is, mm-hmm. a, is, cool. is consistent. I love it. Ketamine's great. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Isn't it fun? Yeah. It's, it's, it's really cool. Don't it, ever it do It spaces yourself much. from yourself so you can look back and ask yourself questions. That's yeah. cool. Don't it, ever it do It spaces too yourself much. from yourself so you can look back and ask yourself questions. This is the effect every time. That's yeah. cool. So you can look back, ask yourself questions. Mm-hmm. I love it. <laughs> I don't know if we have anything more to say about that. Uh, so she says why it all. Why don't we uh, move on? Let's listen to another drug checking session. Okay, we call this one the Lucky Ground Score. All right, we're doing some more testing. Uh, what do you got this uh, for? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. What do you think it is, or hope it is? Uh, it could be Molly, I think. Uh, it's kind of yellow looking. Well, this I'm pretty positive is, is ecstasy because it has the Tesla on it. Oh, that's a piece of a Tesla? Yeah. I like Here. your setup. This is, I found this. <laughs> really? Well. Yeah, I mean, I know. That He's got is. a beautiful little metal box and gorgeous looking blotter with beautiful psychedelic art on it. And yeah, a I little... found it at a bustle in your <laughs> head. Oh, let me see your blotter. Uh, we almost went to that. We were too tired. Yeah. I was trying to go to Action <laughs> Bronson, and then it, it just turned into that, and I sat down yeah. next to a tree, and I saw a joint, and I was like, ooh. And then I saw a little thing next to it, and I was like, that could be something. And it turned out, and to, it be, is. It turned out to be something interesting. Okay, so I mean, it's taking a little crumb of this powder and putting it in the porcelain dish. I don't know if there's enough in there. Interesting color. It's kind of a yellowish. Do you think it might be a crushed up tablet? Could be. Was it found? It was literally yeah. in this. Ground all, score? Yeah, he all found together. this all. Oh, this whole thing okay. he found it's a last ground night. Score. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, let's see. That's a Tesla. Yeah. Oh, so it's not uh, an MDMA. It's hard to tell if that's changing color at all because the, I mean, the powder itself is kind of yellow. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if that turned black, then all we would need to do is Simon's to see if it was MDMA or MDA. Okay. However, now we need to do more tests, and we may not uh, discover what it is, too. That's, there's always that possibility. Gotcha. Okay. Let's go through the whole gamut. Wow, that kind of went brown in the end. Okay, so that did kind of turn a rusty brown. Get a color chart out. Marky, Frody, Mickey, Mandel, and Lieberman. Okay. Is it coming close to anything? Marky, Frody, Mecky, Mandolin. Look at that weird Lieberman color. No clue what this is. <laughs> Space drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. All right. Well, I guess I'll hold off on that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What do you do with something that, you, that came back as none of the above? Uh, throw it away. 
probably throw it away, right? All right, we're looking for black here. We're looking for black. And boom. That's exactly right. And nice reaction. So this one we're looking for blue after the second drop. Okay, one right. drop Simon's yep. and then Simon's B. There we go. Yep, so that's a MDMA. So the LSD was also in that box? Yeah, everything was, was together. Well, you should test your LSD too. Okay. Ah. Yeah, yeah, because it could be an end bomb. Oh, and you yeah, please. don't want that. Pretty much just by the look of it, I was like, this looks pretty. Oh, you can't tell by looking. Oh, yeah, no, no. That's, that's, that's There's even fentanyl that's being put on blotter these days. That I do not like. Uh, 18 little tabs of acid. Quite a valuable stash. Okay. It's going to get weird tonight. Hell yeah. <laughs> We're going to triple dose on L for Jamiroquai. Have you seen them before? <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm, that's like the big thing is I feel like this is a once in a lifetime. We already took a pretty big dose, so we yeah, that's why we have more. to take yeah. more to because otherwise it you won't feel it. <laughs> uh, right now, this this takes a few minutes, okay. uh, but it should turn purple for LSD. Right. Takes a while, huh? It takes a few minutes, yeah. Y'all like that string cheese? It's like seven times this week. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, the cover set tonight is gonna be the big. What are they covering? It's uh, I think it's like women right. of women, women of the galaxy. Yeah. Oh, oh, the Women of the Galaxy yeah. tonight? Yeah, the last set. Cool, well, I'm going to check it out. Definitely. Anything going on there? Definitely take, it always takes a while, more yeah. than you think. Unless it's, this is just like really nice blood paper and the L was somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> just never got applied. Well, that's unusual because, you know, the way they do it, they soak the whole sheet in a tray. Oh. And let it all absorb. The way that some in the same sheet will get stronger or weaker is that they um, hang it up to dry. And then you have to turn it every once in a while so that it, it, but if they don't turn it well enough then the lower half will get stronger. <laughs> this is looking oh, more purple oh, now, isn't it? It is looking purple, huh? Oh, great. Do we hear that people? Yeah. <laughs> Do we hear that people? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. All right, awesome. Thank you guys. You're a wonderful resource and Yeah. Yeah, thanks it, for coming by. Thanks for testing minutes, your drugs right? and being responsible. Yeah, clearly absolutely. purple. Clearly purple. Clearly purple. Yeah. Have a nice night. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> Out of this fucking world. <laughs> Lucky <laughs> ground score. So he just found that laying around? Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> we tested a lot of ground scores that yeah, weekend. Yeah, we did. I don't think anyone got quite as lucky as uh, this guy did. It'd be great to find 18 tabs of acid at a festival, you know? And there is no lost and found, everyone, at festivals when it comes to drugs. So if you do find drugs at a festival, you don't have to feel guilty for uh, for keeping them. <laughs> but definitely test. Uh, absolutely. Don't ever consume a ground score. You have no idea what it is. That's uh, very, very dangerous. So we were all planning on taking LSD that night. Uh, but you and I talk about we how... Did. We, we did. did. We, we did. We were all it. at Jamiroquai <laughs> on LSD. Yeah. Uh, but uh, as we mentioned in this audio, we had to take three times the amount because we had already done a dose of LSD the night before. That's right. And we uh, barely felt anything on Jamiroquai night, even taking triple dose, which is a lesson that we've learned before. We learned it at Burning Man. The idea uh, you need to understand here, people, is that uh, the classic hallucinogens produce a very strong a short-term tolerance where you can't really take it the next day. It's one of the reasons psychedelics aren't addictive. You know, you can't just take them every day. Um, even tripling the dose the second night was uh, not very strong experience. It, it did. Yeah. Uh, it, we did feel something, and we had a good time. You know, to be honest, I loved the string she set, the Women of the Galaxy. Oh my uh, God, it was fantastic. I really have an appreciation for them after this because I've seen what they've created and what their values are. It, it's expressed through this event and also uh, some of the stuff they were saying on stage. They have a little bit of a political consciousness and are uh, encouraging people to be good citizens and be involved. I, I think they're great. I really like yeah, the string Yeah, so what they did is this whole set they invited famous or not so famous women singers to join them on stage and it was an entire cover set of songs honoring female composers and artists. Ann Wilson from Heart was there. She sang Barracuda <laughs> and uh, she reminded me of Janis Joplin. Her voice was so powerful. Uh, it was really uh, 
right? There was just so, such a big energy. It was incredible. Uh, Lisa Fisher was singing. She, I first saw her in that movie, 20 Steps from Stardom. Oh, amazing movie. Yeah, yeah, and it was so much fun to see her on stage, just belting it out and blowing everyone's mind. Uh, Jennifer Hartswick and Rhonda Thomas were also mm-hmm. there. Um, one of them was playing a trumpet, which I love. Yeah. <laughs> I love it, any horns. It was really, uh, really great, uh, everyone. And I, I can't wait uh, to go to Halloween again uh, next year. Absolutely. So uh, in this last section, we're going to hear more from the Dance Day volunteers. And we're also going to hear from uh, a fan from the 90s who showed up and just wanted to say hi and thank you. That's And right. then finish off with a little more Dance Day volunteers. That's right. Okay, here we go. Georgia is not an easy place to be involved in harm reduction or talk about drugs. We live in the real world and people are going to do drugs and there's nothing wrong with someone ingesting drugs if they A, don't hurt other people in the process and if they can just do it safely or at least relatively safely, then what's the problem? We allow people to get drunk. Alcohol is freely legal for people 21 and up. That's a drug. That's a very risky, dangerous drug. We've been in a drug war for decades, and a lot of the information out there is just plain wrong, just plain lies, just plain scare tactics. And we live in a generation that has figured that out. We understand that reefer madness is a lie. And that made all the other drug information out there lose credibility. Uncle Sam has has lost all credibility. So at, at least we can come in and be like, you can trust us. This is the information you can really use. We're not saying just say, no, don't do drugs. We're saying just know the information. When I tell people I volunteer with Dan Safe or people start even recognizing you, like they just get these elated smiles on their face because they love Dan Safe. People get excited about harm reduction. It's really beautiful. Their reactions are always positive and always great. My literal most conservative friends have now donated to Dance Safe. People who have never thought about it before don't feel ignorant asking me a question because I'll answer it with patience and respect. The festival scene can be very healing. Um, Psychedelics are tremendously healing for your soul and for your heart. There are so many things to love about volunteering with Dance Safe. The family that we have here is tight. We really care about each other. We feel safe with each other. There's no friction. We really work together well. Just being able to be here in this community is the best thing about volunteering for Dance Safe. It's this beautiful mutual exchange, I would say. Everybody's just there for each other. We're here to help each other. It's that connection that you never forget. What I really love about volunteering with DanceSafe, DanceSafe in general I love, but honestly, it's knowing that I'm a part of something greater than myself. Like this is paving a pathway for the future. Hi, hi, I'm Luna from New York. Oh, hi Luna, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, hi, thank you. (laughs) Officially uh, shake hands. Uh So should I tell you why I'm excited and how I ended up in this tent? So as soon as I saw the Dance Safe logo, uh, it brought me back to uh, kind of the mid '90s when uh-huh. the raves were really hitting the scene in uh, New York City, uh, Philly, some parts of New Jersey. So my friends and I would, uh, before we received anything that we would use for party favors, we would always go on the website and take a look to see what the uh, possible party favor could prevail in terms of uh, the outcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, uh, she's talking about ecstasydata.org, which began uh, with uh, DanceSafe. I found a laboratory in Sacramento who's willing to test tablets, and they're legally allowed to do that as long as it's mailed anonymously. The DEA came up with this policy in the 60s to help parents learn if they find a pill in their kid's bedroom. There's a way they would send it into a lab who advertised, we'll do this, and then you could call back a few weeks later and get an outgoing voicemail message that would tell you what's in it. With a, you put a code number on the pill. But So I approached a lab who did this and said, hey, and instead of a code number, what if they wrote DanceSafe on it, and then instead of giving them the results in an answering machine, you give me the results, and I'll post the results on the website. And it just took off. 
crashed our servers. We were getting like hundreds of thousands of views. This is the early days of the internet, you know. <laughs> and it's funny you say the early days because it was one of the first times we started having computers in the home. So it would be maybe one or two of our friends would have it. So a bunch of us would make sure to meet at so and so's house so we could start looking it up. So I was part of that crash. Sorry. Great. Yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. You crashed our servers. I did it. I did it. <laughs> Right, what are you testing something today? Uh, no, actually. No. Oh, you just came to say it. Gone. <laughs> well, look, check this out. In those early days, all we had was marquee reagent, this one. And now we've added uh, seven more reagents to the line. You can gain a lot more information. Yeah. Of course, lab testing is the, the ultimate foolproof the ultimate. way. But it, helped. it was like a lifesaver because uh, it would we would look it up and take it seriously. Because at that point, we already believed the Internet. So <laughs> just like everybody does now. Right. So it really was uh, a, a very helpful uh, tool in that sense. So I think I, I could be here today because of dancing. <laughs> At least you had a much better time because of dancing. Absolutely. Luckily, I did. Yes, so far, no uh, horror stories by any means. So, yeah, it's an amazing thing. So, I know it's safety first. So, definitely. This is great. Well, yeah. thanks for saying oh, hi. Thank you so much. It was so nice yeah. to meet you. Hugs? This is so, oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. This is so great. Oh, my gosh. These guys just brought me back so many years. Oh, oh, my, God. oh my God. This is so great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. The current plan is get an ambulance and a mass spectrometer. A mass spec is definitely the next step in where we need to go. Being able to accurately determine potency and purity of substances versus chasing colors around a chart. 20 minutes ago, I tested a substance that was thought to be DMT and a guy was about to take it and it was cut cocaine. The reagent kits are lifesavers, but we need more. Mass spectrometer uh, completely breaks down chemical compounds and tells you exactly what's in it. What we really need is donations. Or if someone could actually donate an ambulance, that would be awesome. A used ambulance, a used mass spec, we don't need it to be new. We need a, a recommissioned, decommissioned ambulance that we can stash all our gear on. We need a dedicated vehicle because Dance Safe saves lives. We could go right into the fields if we need to. We can deck it out like a jungle bus so that we can take it into the woods. These are your nieces and your nephews and your uncles and your aunts and some of you, your parents and your kids and you want us out here. You, you absolutely want us to be on the grounds. You want them to be familiar with us. The whole crowd is safer with us there. So just because you don't do drugs, you know somebody who does. And I guarantee you, if you have young people in your life, you know somebody who's in this festival community, you want us here. You want us keeping them safe. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get those guys of ambulance and that, a mass spectrometer. Yeah, that would be great. You know, actually, I think the technology that drug checking services in Europe are using now is actually a spectroscopy. It's a little bit cheaper than a mass spec. They're tabletop machines, and you get the results very quickly. You, it's basically, you shoot a laser into the powder, and the each molecule gives off a different spectrum of colors of light. And so... Um, you can sort of you can get the results instantly moving the laser around the powder tell everything that's in there So I think these machines right now are about thirty to forty thousand dollars And wouldn't it be great to get uh, a quarter million dollar donation? So dance safe could have five of these machines in different uh, parts of the country that would save so many lives Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a no-brainer, you know, if we really care about saving lives in the face of this uh, Contamination epidemic that's happening in Israel of prohibition. We should have have these tools out there yeah you know and, and you know if you love your country <laughs> you need to realize like we have fallen behind almost every other country in the developed world right all these european countries are now using much better technology than reagents to do what dance safe does but to be able to tell people exactly what's in their drugs so mm -hmm. if you are a real american out there don't you want to see your country get on par with the rest of the world in drug checking yeah um, portugal has outpaced us we have a great show about uh, <laughs> harm reduction in portugal you check canada that out. spain you know spain and portugal are very poor countries in europe and they are already yeah. doing drug checking with spectroscopy machines so you know if you Priorities. know priorities if you know someone with deep pockets uh get them in touch with uh, Dance Safe because um, we really need an upgrade. Uh, and yeah, it'd be great to see Florida Dance Safe get their uh, ambulance too. 
And of course, we want you to contribute $3 a month to us. So we want to remind you about our Patreon. That's uh, patreon.com. And along with the uh, special short content uh, here and there that we're going to put up on our Patreon, you also get our other podcast. It's called Drug Nonsense, where we critique uh, drugs in the media. And please subscribe on your podcast app, whatever it is. And we appreciate those of you who have given us reviews. And if you haven't, please do that because it helps that people find our podcast. That's right. If you listen to us on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify, give us a review. Give us a five-star review because it helps move us up in the promotional queue. Okay, that's it, everyone. I hope you like this show. I did most of the editing and I did all the interviews with the volunteers. And uh, it's a lot of fun for me. See you next time, everyone. Mm-hmm.